Hi everyone, I'm Hema Parmar. I'm a financial reporter for Bloomberg News. I'm very excited to host this event, The Future of Finance, Leveraging Digital Transformation for Business Continuity. Today we're going to examine how financial service leaders like ourselves are embracing digital transformation to improve business continuity, to modernize, modernize processes, and to navigate the mounting challenges we're facing during COVID-19. Today, we'd like to hear from you, the leaders on the front lines of the financial services industry, to discuss how you're prioritizing changes to stay competitive during the COVID-19 crisis and beyond. We will want to hear from you about what the future looks like to you. So before we begin, just a few housekeeping notes. We at Bloomberg are new to virtual events too, so please just bear with us if we experience any technical issues. If you have any trouble with audio or with video quality, please just refresh your browser. If the app crashes or you get disconnected, again, please do just refresh your browser and log back in. You may see my video box currently is blocking the slide behind me. So you can just click on it and move my video box to a different part of your screen and you'll see the slide in its entirety. Of course, we do want to keep this discussion conversational. So if at any point in time you'd like to chime in on a topic, please use the raised hand icon, which you'll see above the screen. If you want, um, you can click on that button when you want to speak and I will do my best to call on you. If you're not speaking, please do keep yourself on mute and then don't forget to unmute yourself when you do get called on to talk. This is an interactive event, and we welcome you to network with your peers. To your right, you'll see a chat box where you can write to me or to each other in the chat. You can feel free to exchange contact information if you want to keep in touch with one another there, too. I also want to thank our sponsor, IBM, for helping make this virtual roundtable possible today. Before we get started, let, I'd like to introduce Harish Grama. He's IBM's general manager for Public Cloud, and he's going to say a few words. Harish, I'll toss it over to you. Thanks, Hema. Uh, hopefully, all of you can hear me. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. I see some people from Europe as well. Uh, welcome to the event, and uh, thank you for making the time to come here. Uh, so, look, I may be from IBM, but uh, you know, in, in the not too distant past, I did do a cloud transformation in a large US bank. I was the CIO for cloud, um, and so I really come at this from uh, both sides of the coin, right? Uh, so if you think about today's landscape, COVID has certainly made it a lot more uh, you know, uh, competitive for us and hard for us to do our business. Uh, but even without that, all of you will absolutely relate to this, but increasing regulatory compliance needs, uh, the fact that uh, you know, data is so critical, all aspects of it, whether you're talking about data sovereignty, whether you're talking about data privacy, uh, you know, prevention against data breaches, uh, the encryption and, and, and the uh, uh, basic security around data, uh, and, and just managing it from an infrastructure perspective when uh, you're trying to do things remotely uh, is very hard. And uh, for all of us here, you know, being in financial services firms, we also do know that uh, a lot of the new players, very successful players, technology players like Facebook, Amazon, Google, et cetera, uh, are also dipping their toes in a very big way uh, into financial services uh, and giving us a run for our money, right? So whether you're a senior technology leader or a senior business leader that uh, depends on technology uh, to get a competitive leg up, uh, you know, you're thinking about how to do business in these uh, trying times, especially given, uh, you know, some of the things that I just said. So what I'd like to do is, uh, you know, I'd like to give you an example, uh, both as a consumer working for a bank and now as a technology provider uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what we've done uh, to, uh, you know, get ahead uh, and, and start our business, uh, our digital transformation, change our operating model, etc. So uh, I want to take you back uh, a few years now, about two to three years, where you know, uh, banks, of course, were one of the last people to actually start adopting public cloud, right? Uh, and when they did start to adopt public cloud, uh, they were putting only applications that had public data associated with it because they simply don't trust. We as uh, bank people simply don't trust uh, the public cloud service providers for anything uh, like confidential data or confidential data with PII. 
So that's a risk mitigate, mitigation strategy that seems to work. But the issue with that is, you know, if we're going to realize the full uh, return on investment that it takes for a bank to use a public cloud, uh, a lot of that app, of the applications really have highly confidential data with PII. So, you know, how do you uh, leverage that better and put those applications out in the cloud uh, in a pay-as-you-go model with elasticity, et cetera, you know, resiliency, all the things that you get. At the same time, banks also face a different challenge, right? Uh, they do a lot of work with fintechs and SaaS providers. And as you know, a lot of these fintechs are basically born on the cloud. So on the one hand, you can mitigate your risk by not putting uh, you know, data that's sensitive on a public cloud. But then on the other hand, you're working with these uh, cloud or these uh, fintechs, I should say, uh, that perhaps give you a mortgage application program for millennials, right? And then you, you know that there is no application that has any more sensitive data than a, a mortgage application would have. It has a life history in it. So uh, <clears throat> banks realize that, you know, double standards and the dichotomy of uh, uh, control that they have. And Bank of America uh, actually tried to do something about it about two years, two and a half years ago. They got the large banks together in the U.S. Uh, and they approached the cloud service providers and said, hey, can you give us an FS utility so we can have our fintechs and SaaS providers run on it so we know uh, they're safe? Long story short, <laughs> Uh, it's hard enough to get anything done in one bank. I'm sure all of you would relate to that. It's impossible to get seven banks together to try and do something, right? Uh, coincidentally, at that point, I switched from this bank that I used to work at back to IBM, uh, and Bank of America approached us, right? Uh, and this was not a usual RFP or anything. This was a top-to-top -top meeting uh, where we said, look, you know, let's go out and build these things, right? I mean, when you look at uh, the kinds of safeguards that you would need uh, for highly confidential data with PII, it would be things like data, isolation of the data plane from the control plane. It would be encryption of data. It would be finely granular uh, uh, identity and access management controls. Uh, it would be the right audit points, the right report points, uh, the right monitoring points, and finally dashboarding, reporting, and a way to ensure that once you're compliant, that you continue to be compliant, right? So this resulted in uh, basically uh, close to 500 controls that Bank of America and IBM identified in order to start getting to a compliant uh, posture. Uh, and uh, we've been on that journey building it out. And uh, you know, later this month, uh, 14th of July, we're going to announce uh, the IBM Financial Services Cloud. We've already announced it uh, in terms of the concept and the design. And now we're going to deliver this on the 14th of uh, July uh, with Bank of America, BNP Paribas, uh, and a few other banks around the world uh, being a party to that, right? So that is some of the innovations that we're seeing out there that we've been able to work as a technology provider with financial services institutes. Clearly, we want to go into insurance, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, you know, I wanted to kind of seed this conversation and ask all of you to think about how you're leveraging these new technologies. You know, obviously, I come from public cloud, so I say public cloud. Uh, but 5G or any other disruptive technology to change your operating model in these times and get you well on your way to uh, dig digital transformation. So uh, with that as a preamble, Hema, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Harish. Um, so you pointed to a number of ways that the financial services industry is changing. One of the big ways that we're seeing right now um, is the environment that we're experiencing during this quarantined time, where you've had to see a lot of you know, the big companies move their staff, you know, the large majority of their staff, to a work-from-home remote environment within just a matter of weeks, very quickly. Um, so I'm curious what, how you've navigated that kind of digital transformation um, and how you've been able to adjust and keep pace. Naveed, would you like to kick it off? Yeah, yeah, sure, thank you. Thank you, Emma. You know, the COVID-19 uh, has been one more catalyst uh, towards achieving a digital transformation. We have been are transforming our operating and business model now for a number of years. And that approach is essentially informed by recognizing the range of new technologies uh, which are reaching the inflection point 
the market transitions. So say in the context of ESG, the shifts we are seeing in globalization and reshaping of the supply chains. And of course, more importantly, how are clients' expectations and their business and operating models are shifting. So those four or five considerations have really informed our strategy to transform. So we essentially are very focused on uh, transforming a business and operating model. So in other words, our core infrastructure and core processes, our portfolio of capabilities and delivery channels, and the investment in new solutions as well as innovation. So if you look at the combination of the consideration and then the strategy and the fact that we have been executing it for a number of years now, uh, came in uh, very handy when we were had to respond to COVID-19. So this, this unprecedented phenomenon, at least in our lifetimes, we were able to uh, move most of our staff, about 90% plus remotely. Um, we didn't experience any disruption or logistical uh, friction. And at the same time, we enabled our clients to continue to do their business. So my point is that I think COVID-19 is a further, uh, is providing a further impetus to make a transition towards a digital, a complete digital operating and business model. Absolutely. Takas, I see your hand up. Um, did you have thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I just want to build on what uh, Navi was just saying. So for us, it's a pretty similar story. Uh, there was a complete shift to work from office, from home within a matter of a few days. While at the same time, we were also seeing a spike in volume. On a typical day, we move $7 trillion. At the end of March, we were moving close to 10. Um, and yet, a little bit to my surprise, uh, the operational resilience of the business and of the industry was actually there. And now, three months in into the COVID crisis, with most of the people in most parts of the world still working from home, we have not really seen any material impact in terms of the speed of delivery in technology, in terms of how we are able to serve our customers, uh, in terms of any of the operational metrics, in terms of the deliverables that we have in front of us. So I would say it's more or less BAU. Yes, Zoom has replaced in-person meetings, but it's more or less BAU. Uh, the two comments that I would make is, this has worked for the last three months, it's not clear for me if it's kind of, you know, it can work um, indefinitely because there is value to having people working together. There is value to whiteboarding. There is value to team meetings in person. There is value to that community that people build in the office. So I'm hoping that at some point we will be able to, to get back to BAU. The, the one component that I would stress though is that even though the vast majority of the people were able to work from home, we had something like three and a half thousand people that could not work from home. And these are the people that, uh, that uh, manage uh, paper transactions, what is known as the lockbox, um, which is kind of a, a big component of the business for a lot of our clients because 40% of payments in the US still happen by check. And I would say two things there. First, uh, we were able to maintain the social distancing, keep our people safe, give them food, transportation, and everything else, and still manage to maintain uh, the processing of that paper volume. But at the same time, for the first time, I'm optimistic that the amount of paper, at least in the United States, because the US is a little bit unique in that respect, will start going down. Uh, because our clients are much more receptive to conversations around uh, transforming paper to electronic, because they realize that there is a real risk there. It's not only whether JP Morgan will be open, it's also whether the post office will be open and their mail will get delivered. So I'm hoping that that will provide kind of further incentive um, to reduce the amount of paper uh, and use some of the more modern electronic payment methods. Excellent. Yeah, Takis, you pointed to a good point about um, how quickly everyone's been able to adapt to these times, um, but then questioning the longevity of sustaining 
business as usual or the way it is today anyway. Rania, how have you changed things over at Scotiabank to adapt? Thanks, Emma. Uh, just to add to what uh, my colleagues Naveed and Takis were talking about, I mean, I think the pandemic has really had a profound impact on how we interact with our employees as well as with our customers and has been a great catalyst in terms of the acceleration of the digital transformation journey that we've been on over the past five years. Uh, to kind of add to what Naveed was saying at Scotiabank, we've been on this digital journey for a number of years that has served us really well into kind of making a decision to move everyone to work from home. Over 90% of our staff globally are working from home and making sure that our systems are resilient, uh, that we've invested in our infrastructure and technology from a safety and security perspective. Um, so that has allowed us to be able to continue to deliver for our clients during this pandemic. Um, and then in terms of interactions with our customers, from an employee perspective, I would say that We've also been on an agile mindset journey. And so agile is not really just for technologists, and particularly my business, I run the payments business for the bank globally. And so leveraging tools, going back to what Tacos was saying, like daily huddles, interactions, whiteboarding, and, and leveraging new technologies and innovative solutions. I would say we haven't skipped a beat in terms of ideation, whiteboarding. We're constantly testing new technologies to be able to continue on that. And I would say the sentiment is a lot of employees are finding this work-life balance right now, and many of them are not looking forward to actually returning to the office, including, interestingly enough, some of the people who are naysayers about productivity and how working from home impacts productivity. I think the key thing that we're going to have to be sensitive about is right now, many of us, the majority of us are working from home. But when some of us go back to the office versus some stay at home, how is that going to work? How will that work from an equality perspective, from an interaction perspective, and kind of a collaboration perspective? On the customer perspective, what's been interesting is we've been extremely busy, obviously, as, as I assume many of my colleagues, in supporting the government on a lot of the relief programs. And, uh, and in Canada, there's been a time where some of the check processing uh, units have shut down. So that has been a significant catalyst for not just our customers to get off checks, but for our government to also support that move away from checks. And so uh, I think that has been a catalyst that a silver lining in all of this pandemic is really uh, pushing forward on our digital adoption for both our customers. And for us, I would say internally, in terms of eliminating some of the manual processes that we've had uh, to ensure that we are digitizing not just the customer experience, but our end-to-end -end process as well. So, so to be honest, I'm seeing a lot of benefits and it's just really gonna accelerate our level of investment, our level of innovation uh, that will really help propel us forward in terms of moving away from some of the paper processes and, and continuing on this journey. Excellent. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on one of the thoughts you made there, which is adjusting to some semblance of normalcy, whether that's people working from home as well as in the office. Once we once we get back to a post, once we get to a post-COVID um, lifestyle, when we get back to some semblance of normalcy, what changes do you think um, will persist over the long term that we've seen implemented today? What big takeaways do you think will last even beyond the, the pandemic that we're in right now? Lamont, do you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I think one of the bigger challenges for us is really going to be culturally. Um, I think as all my colleagues sort of stated, uh, most of us had the building box in place to be able to a very quickly scale work from home programs. Uh, I think we've all sort of stepped up to the plate to ensure that we didn't miss a beat in terms of servicing our clients. I think the sort of question becomes, there's no true definition of what the sort of post COVID normal will actually look like. And I think it's gonna challenge many of us as senior leaders uh, in terms of identifying how we deal with sort of what might be a dichotomy between colleagues, right? You're gonna have folks that will have zero issue returning to the office. I happen to be in the office today. And then you're also gonna have a sub-segment of your colleagues who not only enjoy the prospects of, of working from home and being a bit more productive, but in many cases, I think that sort of fear that some colleagues have around returning to large grouping environments may persist for a lot longer than I think people give it credit for. So, you know, our ability to be able to sort of deal with certain factions uh, of our colleague base and ensure that productivity uh, continues, I think is really gonna challenge us culturally from a leadership perspective. Uh, to me, that's where our ability as, as leaders to create the types of agile environments that are necessary in order to drive colleague productivity, that key mix between both technology, high tech and high touch 
uh, is not only critical for the solutions that we actually deliver to our clients, but it's going to be critically important as we sort of think about what that sort of, you know, post-COVID, new normal, whatever we want to call it, looks like uh, for our own colleague base. Uh, and I think it's going to be a real challenge for the industry, but I think we've got the building blocks in place to be able to step up for that challenge. Yeah, so pointing to the cultural aspects of a new world as well as technological advances too and adaptions. Daniel, what, um, what changes are you preparing for within your team and, and your workplace um, to adjust to a new sense of normal? Um, and what does that look like, do you think, for you? Yeah, I, I would like uh, uh, to reflect also on the moment of the transition before COVID into COVID and what will be COVID afterwards. I think COVID has demonstrated the value of the invisible preparation work that no one knows uh, is there. I mean, we. We, we ramped up, up our connectivity, our VPN connectivity from a few thousand people a day to more than 50K in few hours. That doesn't happen by flipping a switch. I mean, that happens because in the past two years, some people were working on preparing the capability without anyone else knowing. So I think COVID has demonstrated the value of the invisible work that IT does to be ready for events like this one. And I'm, and I'm extremely proud of what uh, IT and technology has done to keep the, the boat afloat uh, during the, especially the initial part of the crisis. In Italy, uh, the crisis, uh, let's say in organizational terms, started the uh, end of February. And in a matter of a few days, we had everybody home uh, and we were in crisis mode. Uh, and, and, and IT just took the blow and, uh, and kept the, the boat afloat. So uh, the value of the hidden work is one uh, huge, uh, huge uh, recognition. Then COVID is uh, transforming the way our customers are consuming uh, uh, banking services, knowing that some of them will become more digital, of course, but many of them will still stay in the previous world. And we need to find ways to serve them in a COVID remote work uh, type of, uh, of setting. And this is one part of the journey ahead. And then the last bit that I'd like to share is uh, COVID has demonstrated that digital is not a technology game. And I'm provocative on this one. Digital is not just throwing more toys and throwing, throwing more tools into the pond and believing you become uh, digital and become something better or something, uh, I would say, more e easy to use. Digital, at the end of the day, is a people's story. Digital is designing products and services to be usable by, I would say, lazy and, uh, and impatient customers, i.e. you don't want to click two, uh, two times more, you don't want to, uh, to wait more than a half a second. And that's not a technology game, that's a skill, people, attitude, product design game. And this is what COVID is showing us. Right? If you want to become more digital, we need to think to the end-to-end -end customer experience uh, in, a, in a relentless way, in a different way than what we did before. So the value of people as it pertains to integrating with technology and also the value of preparedness. Massively. when an emergency situation happens like we're seeing now. Ido, I see you have thoughts on this topic. Ido, you're on mute, mute just there. Yes, yes, I just had to scroll up to unmute it. Um, yeah, I think uh, a few things. First of all, I agree with uh, most of uh, the points that were made before, but a couple of uh, things to highlight. Uh, one is that when you look at the transition to work from home, uh, one of the challenges you have, I think, uh, was mentioned by Takis around, you know, paper-based type of functions, but there are also functions like uh, call centers and BPO in that, you know, are typically uh, we run out of uh, low-cost countries or geographies. And, um, you know, the, the added challenge that you have in those geographies is that the home environment is not necessarily always um, conducive to uh, working from. So, for instance, internet connectivity is not something that's always available in a reliable way. Um, you know, space um, and uh, even equipment, even just a, a plain computer that you can deploy onto uh, or, or take uh, from the office. So we had um, struggled uh, with, um, you know, with getting those, um, uh, those people effective and operational. And um, we've done a pretty decent job because what we've done is, and this is where I think cloud is really shining, is we've relied on some cloud technologies to uh, implement things like contact center in the cloud, uh, VPN uh, ramp up, uh, we ramped up, to, uh, you know, as, as was said before, very, very rapidly by using uh, cloud scaling. Uh, VDI is an example uh, for people that, uh, you know, we couldn't ship the equipment to them because security wouldn't let us kind of take it through the cities. Uh, we were able to deploy VDI very quickly to them so they can become operational. So I think the conclusion from that is that uh, cloud scaling has really showed that, you know, it's... Um, uh, it, it really delivered on the message and, and on the promise of uh, scaling. A, a great example of that is Teams from Microsoft. Um, 
you know, they had at some point 700% growth uh, within the first week, I think, uh, of uh, everybody going to work from home. And with the exception of some, um, you know, some issues they had on the first day, they really scaled up very quickly, which they would have never been able to do without the uh, cloud scaling capability. So that's one point I wanted to make. The other one is that um, it's very fascinating to see when we moved everybody to work from home, how quickly we were able to get people to actually learn how to use the collaboration packages. Something that would have taken us probably two years to get people skilled in, in how to use Teams uh, to the end degree in terms of collaboration, um, they've learned within weeks. And the reason is you know, necessity. So necessity has really driven uh, a change in terms of the mindset of people around how to use technology. I think we are now at the point where our management and our teams realize that you can do a lot of what they never believed you can do uh, in a digital way and uh, remotely. So that opens up a whole set of opportunities for us. And if you think about it, right now you ask the question of what will happen post-COVID. The reality is we're already starting to take steps. So for instance, our footprint is going to be um, cut down by half most likely. So that means we're never going to go back into everybody in the office. And uh, at least half of our people are going to be continuing to work remotely. Now that brings up a question that I think Takis mentioned, which is not everybody is, it's not sustainable for everyone. I mean, if you have agile teams that are working on highly innovative initiatives, you need to actually get them together across, you know, in, a, in an agile type of environment that they can work on this. So the question we're facing now is, what are the type of functions that will require to be in the office versus not? What kind of role do we have in rotation? So can we build a model that basically says you rotate people so they're spending two days a week in the office and the rest of the days off? Uh, how much of, um, you know, of, of that rotation can be managed to lower our footprint overall? So those are the type of things we're looking at. And there's other implications in all aspects of the business. So I'll take one example is, for instance, if you look at our executives that typically go and meet up with CEOs in the market, with analysts and so forth, They've moved from being able to do maybe two analyst calls a day to doing close to 10 analyst calls a day. Why? Because they don't have to navigate through the streets of New York and they don't have to navigate through security in the buildings. They can just switch very quickly from one to the other. And if we can retain some of that capability moving forward in terms of the acceptance level, I think we can make that whole interaction and travel a lot more efficient, which is bad news for the travel industry, because I think they're about to lose 50% of their business travel uh, volumes. I don't see us going back to more than 50% spend on, on, tra on business travel, as an example. So um, there's a lot of interesting aspects of this that are coming to, to life now, to light now, that we're looking at. One, one last one I mentioned is BCP. You know, we used to think that from a BCP standpoint, if you can set up another facility somewhere where the people can go to that facility and operate, then we're good. We're covered from a BCP standpoint. Well, guess what? I mean, what we've seen now is that we have to assume that people won't be able to move. The only place they would be able to move is back to their homes. So we need to have a solution for BCP that really allows people to either work from home or move the actual workload to another geography. So all of those things are starting to come up and uh, are very interesting in terms of how that shapes our, our work uh, moving forward um, on the business side, on the enterprise side. And then from a product and from a consumer behavior, there's a lot of changes that are happening. I mean, some of the things were mentioned around uh, the uh, reduction on reliance on things like checks and so forth in North America. But if you think about um, touchless payment, nobody wants to touch a, a keyboard anywhere anymore. So moving, we're starting to see that movement in transactions into touchless more and more. We're starting to see traditional point of sale type uh, um, merchants moving to virtual point of sale. So there's a lot of movement in that space that's going to last for a long time post this COVID. Thank you. So yes, a lot of adaption and change from touchless keyboards to cloud computing. Uh, Michael, what changes have you implemented to adjust to this time um, on the digital side? Or what, yeah. what technologies have you ramped up? Yeah, I think I think what you've heard, we, we, we've talked about a bunch of these things. You know, we were able to very successfully transition, transition, excuse me, to uh, to a work from home model. Uh, going back to Danielle's point, you know, the preparation that we did ahead of time to this change was was absolutely key and instrumental for us to be able to do that. But I think what you're hearing overall on this call is that uh, 
with the introduction of the constraints, the COVID constraints, we're all being forced to innovate in different ways. And so those, the COVID constraints are forcing us to think differently about how we work with our teams. Um, you know, I would say the new normal of working from home uh, or in a blended style where you have people in the office uh, and at the uh, and at home is causing uh, organizations to think differently. And to touch on something that Lamont said, I thought was really important. He talked about the cultural shift. There's a cultural shift inside the company uh, in terms of how do we work. And I, actually what we find is that the barriers, when you talk about that balance, that work-life balance, uh, you actually see people working more. Uh, and so the, the, the focus on work point, the work life balance becomes a little bit more interesting because even though you're at home, the boundaries between home and work are, are less clear and, and understanding of, you know, sometimes you're on a conference call at seven o'clock at night or, you know, five o'clock in the morning. And so how do you balance that out? But one of the interesting things I think we're all going to face on that cultural level is that for all of us, we're all very large companies, big financial institutions, and it's not just about us. It's about the ecosystem that we live inside. We have partners, we have customers, and they're all facing the same uh, work from home. They're facing the same COVID challenges. They're facing the same technology challenges. And that blend of that ecosystem of your partners working with you, working with your customers, with your compliance, you know, all of those constraints that you're all having is going to force additional swirl, additional focus inside uh, the organization as a whole as to how we deliver our, our end products to our, to our customers. So I think when you think about how it's changed, I think cloud has become, uh, it's a de facto. A lot of us have, uh, you know, sort of legacy applications that have been around a long time that are hard to move or refactor to the cloud. Uh, but I think from an access perspective, how are consumers are consuming the products and services, uh, they are driving a substantial change at, at different layers, whether it's the access layer of how they come in and use your products or the expectations of how those products interact with other products that you may have or others in your ecosystem may have. So I think I think the changes that we're seeing today are cultural, they're techno technological, but there's also this interaction, you know, we probably do business, everyone on this phone or on this uh, video, sorry, uh, probably interacts uh, at a business level with all the, with everyone else on this call at some point. So I think you know how we all blend together is going to become important, and the expectation ultimately of our consumers is going to help drive a lot of that adoption uh, and some of the change that we are going to have to make internally as well. No, yes, very good points. Swami, I wanted to bring you in on this. Um, what, do, what do you think about the risk of cybersecurity? How do you protect against cybersecurity threats? Are we more vulnerable? now given the reliance on cloud and people working from home and um, people not having access to their physical workspaces how do you reconcile this this issue and is it a greater issue now nowadays yeah thank you Emma. i'm sure you're saving the best for the last uh, you know one of the things that uh, we know even before covid is the insider threat uh, is one of the most um, vulnerable threats that uh, we would have from a cybersecurity perspective. If you look at any statistics, uh, a majority of the threats come from insiders. So with all the equipment and 22,000 employees uh, working remotely at SMP Global, we have built a platform that protects us from the insider threats, You know whether it is training our employees with the phishing simulations, uh, ensuring that uh, we have the multi-factor authentication, all those activities that we have done leading to pre-COVID really helped uh, in the post-COVID, you know, whether you call it a new normal or new abnormal. So from, from your question perspective, we had to be more cautious about data loss prevention in light of COVID, and we are responding to uh, very aggressively to appropriate changes that will prevent us from any additional new risks uh, that uh, COVID may have brought to us. Takis, I see your hand is up as well. Did you have thoughts on this topic? Uh, yeah, just going back to your original question, and, and I agree with uh, <clears throat> a lot of what uh, my colleague said. I just wanted to offer two more uh, <clears throat> two more comments. One is the kind of going back to normal or whatever normal is going to look like will look different in different parts of the world. Um, I would say for all intents and purposes, China is mostly back to be a U. 
and most of our clients and many of our employees are back in the office. And I think there is an expectation there that you will be back to very close to 100%. Hong Kong is more or less at the same place. Uh, Europe is kind of beginning to go back in the office and you see in places like London more willingness for people to go back. In the US, obviously, we are kind of one step behind. So I think we also need to take into account the global aspect because you may have some parts of the world back in the office, some parts of the world working from home and some parts somewhere in between. The second on the people aspect, I think when you look at our population, there's kind of three categories and the percentages vary by region and by the number of COVID cases, et cetera. But there is one portion of the population which is still apprehensive and will likely remain so until either there is a vaccine or COVID kind of disappears. There is a significant portion of the population that can't wait to go back to the office, either because working from home for them is really hard, small apartments, bad Wi-Fi connectivity, et cetera, et cetera. And then there is a group of people that wouldn't mind at some point going back to the office, but they face real practical constraints around schools that have not reopened, around taking care of uh, elderly in their families, et cetera. So my view on all of that is we just need to be flexible. Uh, we've proven to ourselves that we can be effective working from home. So we need to give people time. We need to see how the situation evolves. So as far as I'm concerned, we are taking it kind of one day or one week at a time. We don't necessarily make long-term decisions around, you know, everyone will work from home forever or everyone will be back at 100% in six months. We just give ourselves the flexibility, give it time, see how it evolves, and then act accordingly. Absolutely. I think everyone's on a week-by-week -week situation trying to figure things out um, uh, during during this time. Harish, you wanted to chime in? Yeah, thanks, Hema. So, uh, you know, uh, listening to all of the people here on the panel talk about COVID and uh, the work-life balance and how people work remotely, I completely relate to that, right? I mean, I think it, it seems to be a world-over phenomenon, uh, especially as I talk to my clients, um, you know, all over the world. Uh, the one thing I wanted to pick up on was, you know, both uh, uh, Ido and Michael mentioned cloud, uh, you know, specifically, uh, although many others, uh, you know, insinuated that some of the technologies that we're using were on cloud. Uh, Ido, you, you had said that, uh, you know, it took a while for people to really start to embrace these technologies and get productive and so on and so forth. And, and I completely see that, right? But I'd like to get your perspective, all of you, your perspective, uh, on how you, especially those of you who are uh, CIOs and IT, uh, you know, providers for your firm, uh, what what kind of trends are you seeing? Let me give you some examples, right? I now, as a technology vendor, uh, you know, you know, you made this comment that uh, collaboration tools are up up on the rise, and, and surely I see this, right? I mean, uh, Zoom. Somebody mentioned Zoom. We're on a Zoom-like tool right now. Uh, for me. Looking at my cloud consumption, you know, I see that virtual desktops are through the roof, completely through the roof, right? As people start to work remotely. Now, on a lighter vein, I'll also tell you that one of the other things that did really well and is continuing to do really well is gaming, right? So clearly, people sitting at home are working, but they're also playing, <laughs> which which everyone needs, right? Uh, so I see that up on the rise as well. But uh, what I was getting to was, uh, you know, one of the banks I was speaking with. Uh, the cloud transformation head of that bank uh, was telling me that you know the things that he could not get through his CISO's organization in order to innovate and put it on a cloud for the last three years, within the first four to six weeks of COVID, you know he had all kinds of permission to start to innovate and put some of these tools up so their employees, all being remote, could start to be productive or continue to be productive uh, and uh, you know, keep it as a going concern. So, was just curious uh, how you, as technology providers for your uh, banks and financial institutes, how do you see this play out? I think Swami had his hand up to answer this. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Harish. Uh, that's a very in interesting question. You know, before COVID, um, we had presence in thirty-five countries uh, and eighty offices. Uh, now with the 22,000 employees and, and 2,000 consultants. Now I feel like uh, I have 22,000 offices to manage, right? 
So to your point, uh, yes, uh, there's a lot of uh, you know demand for these uh, cloud-based collaboration uh, technologies, uh, and there are some new ones so that we can do the design thinking sessions uh, uh, in a collaborative way. But I think the biggest things where we see we are investing in is how do you really manage uh, the the 22,000 offices, if you will, so that we can have AI ops, so that we can predict a particular performance uh, depreciation that a particular employee is having. And second thing is when we think about um, you know, developing applications, developing services, we have to really think about the edge a uh, lot more, especially for the 22,000 employees that we have. So the technologies that would provide a lot more services at the edge is an important aspect of our uh, new investments as well. Vanya, go ahead. So uh, <clears throat> what I would say, Harish, is um, I think what's happened here is, and, and going back to what Danielle was saying, is I think um, I straddle business and technology. I'm one of the for fortunate people who's got salespeople, product, digital, as well as technology. And what I've seen is there the heightened appreciation of technology. This pandemic has really kind of showcased the importance of te the technology teams and what they do behind the scenes. So, so going to what you're saying, Danielle, it's all that preparation. And so there's a much bigger appreciation for what technologists do. So I, so I think that's a, that's a key important element that this pandemic has created. But I think what also has happened is it's created a lot more focus on delivering value to our employees and our customers. So a lot of the noise and the competing priorities across the organization has really kind of fallen away and created that sense of, key priorities that need to be delivered and listening to our key partners in terms of how we're going to deliver that. And so talking and, ha and that really links into the culture. We've been doing a lot of reflection internally as leaders as to how come we were a lot more effective, a lot more decisive. We can move a lot faster in this type of environment. And I think it's because all of the competing priorities have fallen away and we've narrowed it down to a focused approach. And that really drives productivity and results. And so so I would say that's why. So even though these discussions have been going on for a long time, it, this has really kind of brought it to the forefront in terms of, you know, where are we investing our money? How valuable is it to our customers and our employees and to our shareholders? And let everything else fall away. And so I think everyone's revisiting their roadmaps and focusing in on the things that are, are critical in nature. And I think that's something that's going to continue over the next 12 to 18 months, given the uncertainty around, you know, uh, the economy, our customer base, the way we operate and so on. So, so I think, I think that's, that's really the reason why I think everyone's been able to move along, but I, I'd love to hear from my other colleagues. Lamont, did you want to chime in? I see your hand up. No, I, I, I would uh, just echo um, those thoughts. I think sure. sort of COVID is, is, is really sort of expedited uh, some of the strategies that I think most of us as banks already had in place. So we were already sort of going digital, many of us working on transformations to not only digitize the front end of our solutions, but obviously digitize both the middle and, and the back office. Um, you know, the example that I know has been cited by a lot of my colleagues in the U.S. is you know, how we all sort of came together once the government announced the PPP program. And literally overnight, uh, many of us had to transform not only the ways in which we actually develop and deploy technology, but even decision-making rights. And we had senior leaders literally on call, making real-time calls around what we were gonna do with that program. And, and, you know, we had the ability to sort of deploy our PPP solution in a matter of two weeks, something that I think in an old environment may have taken us sort of months to do. And so the new normal that I get excited about that I think is very, very clear is our ability as a financial institution to really focus on core problems, focus on adding real value and really getting decision makers to cut across all of the muck to really focus on delivering those solutions. So that's the real, at least in my opinion, the, the, uh, the, the real new normal that I'm excited about. In terms of investments, I think all of us are going to find ourselves um, looking at incremental investments in new technologies. And part of this is just because this is the way consumers are going to continue to engage with us, right? We're gonna have customers who try some digital solutions for the first time, or in many cases, customers who actually are pushing us to have more advanced solutions just based off of the fact that they're not gonna go back to their sort of former new normal. So I think it's gonna be up to us 
uh, not just to digitize because it's the right thing to do to make our businesses more efficient. It really is up to us to digitize because that is the expectation of our clients in many cases on a go forward basis. Absolutely. I think you've both touched on two things, which is this nothing quite like a pandemic to really force companies to evolve and adapt and change um, and and to to make them the best or most out of the situation as you can. Um, they say innovation Hannah, can is- I, Can I just add a couple of things? Sure, is that Sharon? Yes, yeah. Go ahead, Sharon. Hello, great. Um, so I think, I think the one thing that I'm, Sharon, do you still hear us? I think we're having a bit of trouble, can, Sharon. Can you, oh. can you hear Naveed? Naveed is talking. I, I'll, I'll, I don't hear Naveed, no. I'll... Sharon, go ahead. Right, okay. So I'm going to go ahead. So, so I think what's the, 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 the... Okay, so... I think the, um, sorry, Naveed was talking um, and I, obviously there was only a small amount of people that could hear him. So I think the one thing that really, um, really excites me as, as a potential outcome is, is really this, this newfound agility that, um, that all organisations have, have had. I mean, we've heard a lot of it talked about just, just on this call. Um, and I think it's going to be really important going forward that we, that we capture that. That we've seen clients that we've been working with for a long time around digitizing their processes front and back office processes um, and we've seen clients who you know sheer actual force of the impact of COVID have really had to move swiftly in terms of not just remote working but also the continuation of those customer services getting their contact centers going and making sure that they you know not only are available but also performant in terms of the scale of the uh, incremental volume that that went through those as a result so you know we've seen clients turn digital ideas into digital implementations within days through COVID. And I, I think that is a, you know, it's a really interesting lesson for us as to how that newfound agility can be adopted going forward when, you know, we're from a financial services point of view, we're, we're, we're not known for taking huge amounts of risk. So, so it's a really interesting, I think, um, you know, conundrum as to how when forced to do so we were able to mobilize um, and create all aspects of solutions for that, that were needed out there whether whether existing or the new ones that we've talked about in terms of the political government um, assigned um, facilities that needed to be set up through uh, through the financial services institutions so so I think there's a lot to be a lot to be gleaned from that that we should capture and um, and make sure we we keep going forward um, we're also seeing you know the operational resiliency piece is is one which is um which is also being tested so you know this is a subject which you know has is all is always hot so to speak but is actually getting you know hotter in many respects um and i know there's been lots of talk about zoom and, and teams so you know for example can you imagine a, a ddos attack on any of our webex or teams or zoom platforms it would have been probably just annoying in january 2020 um but in july 2020 you know frankly it would be crippling we wouldn't be you know we wouldn't be doing what we're doing today but equally we wouldn't be doing what we're um, doing every single day both with our customers and also you know across our team so so i think it poses a very interesting question about the dichotomy of how the operational resiliency landscape has changed as a result of covid and um, and where we take it Absolutely. Naveed, we don't have you, do we? we? Oh, we'll give it a couple minutes and then we'll get back to him. I know he has some thoughts he wanted to share. Um, I don't still, I don't hear Naveed. So I'm going to just keep going. And then once we get him back, we'll, we'll get to his, his thoughts. Naveed? I still don't hear Naveed. So Naveed, I'm going to put you on, we'll just pause on you for a moment. And then once we see and hear you, we'll definitely bring you back in. To the point um, on agility and adapting to these times, um, they say that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. I'd like to talk a bit about innovation and competitiveness and how you manage um, innovation when everyone's working from home? Is that being compromised? Can you still have the same kinds of brainstorming 
where if you're not in a conference room together, all chatting about how to be creative or how to stay competitive, um, how has how are you managing through that that specific hurdle? Michael, do you want do you want to tackle that? Sure, I think I think um, you know with regards to what this does from an innovation perspective. We talked a little bit before about how uh, the constraints cause more innovation to happen. It's not just culturally, it's not just within the organization, but I think with, with what's going on in terms of um, the changes in our consumer behavior, uh, the changes in how and what people expect from their financial services partners, whether that be on the, uh, on the, on the credit card side from a merchant perspective all the way through uh, sort of you know sort of the back end uh, financial systems, I think there's a, a series of changes that are happening there that it's forcing us to think about you know the lay, the multiple layers of innovation from an access perspective for how that information gets aggregated from a how does the information and what should be the approach uh, you know I think uh, Harish talked about uh, you know the introduction of introduction of cloud and and being able to use it but it's really it's not just about the cloud right it's about data it's a data it's it's turning more and more into a data driven set of requirements that we are having to look at uh, and having to build around and then build solutions around whether you're talking about field and level field level encryption so that you could utilize cloud uh, in a much more aggressive way perhaps than you would normally um, the interaction between you know those assets and those capabilities that you want to maintain as an organization uh, in the house. I think all of these things are coming together and forcing organizations to think about how does our end-to-end -end architecture look today? How do we connect to our customers? How do we connect to our partners? And what changes in expectations on speed, timing, uh, security, all of those things are coming into uh, into focus. I mean, they've always been in focus, but they're really becoming uh, very focused underneath the, you know, and as a result of the, the, the COVID crisis. Uh, you know, we talk, go, just going back, right, the ability to bring that focus, what we call COVID clears, uh, uh, COVID clarity and COVID urgency are terms, terminology we use to help drive and get, you know, sort of fast track a lot of the innovation that we're having because we know there's a huge benefit, a huge impact to our customers right away. So I think it's, I think it's changed how we develop. It's definitely changed on how we operate and it's, it's just changed just about every aspect uh, of how we think about our work and our products, uh, you know, across the spectrum. Yes, COVID clarity. Very, very um, interesting topic. Um, Naveed, did you want to, Naveed, did can you you want to talk? Yes, we can. I can yeah. hear you. Yes. So, sorry, I've been in and out and uh, the technology is so 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 much for the technology uh i just want to make a couple of comments uh one is this working from the office or home i don't think it's a binary choice i think what covid 19 has done it has taught us or we have learned what is possible beyond the traditional structures and traditional ways of working you know, naturally, virtual uh, working virtually from home has its benefits, but the physical space has lots of advantages which are not available in a virtual space. This is social cohesion, development of culture, and if you look at the research, most of the learning actually happens in the office settings because you learn from each other. And I think there's one important element here that it will enable us a combination of working from office and virtually will enable the companies to pursue diversity even more so because there are people who have set of circumstances they would rather work from home uh, single parents or people may have the primary uh, caretakers so i think the businesses will have a far greater flexibility to adjust based on the needs of the sub-segments of its workforce. Uh, so I would look at it in a very positive manner. The second point I want to make is on, uh, on this crisis. And I think somebody alluded to it earlier on. You know, just to, if you, if you look at the word crisis in Chinese, it has two characters. One means 
danger. The other one means opportunity. Essentially, what happens is in time of crisis, the orientation is more towards risk than towards the opportunity. And if there is a strong, compelling economic logic to something, then during the time of crisis, I think it's a lot easier to get it done because organizational barriers tend to uh, fall away. But if you look at some of the uh, one of the recent McKinsey survey, where the question was asked during the crisis, what is your focus on innovation? So pre-crisis, it was about 55% in terms of the importance. Now it dropped uh, down to about 30, 30% of their thereafter uh, or thereabouts. And then as we go through the crisis, it uh, slightly picks up. And then in a normal economic environment, then it try and regains its original focus. My point is that during the crisis, uh, it is very important for us uh, as business leaders that we don't lose sight of the opportunities it offers and which obviously requires investment and continuous innovation. Because when you come out to the other side, your ability to lead the market or gain significant ad advantage will be far greater than the fact if you stifle the business during the time of crisis. Thanks, Navid. I wanted to stretch that thought over to Swami. Um, how you're looking at innovation and managing risk and opportunity. Yeah, I think Navid is uh, spot on, you know, the cultural aspects of it and the opportunity. I think the, the most important thing is we have to build in post-COVID world on the foundation that uh, you already may have built in the pre-COVID world. If you are, if you have the foundation, like Michael has mentioned, in the pre-COVID world, you can go on that rails and make the tweaks, uh, you know, bearing some of the you know, um, collaboration challenges that we talked earlier. At SMP Global, what we have done is um, we kind of combined three things. You know, Essential Tech is a program that we had where we took seven areas where we said that in order for us to innovate, we had to first upskill our employees. So all of our 20,000 employees had an opportunity to upskill themselves in seven key areas. And then we said that we need to then give our employees an immersion experience where they get to work on projects. So we have a lot of cohorts that we built on those seven areas and then map that to the future of the work uh, on how do we develop the careers of the people along that essential tech training that we have done, essential immersion. And then all of the three are integrated with uh, an innovation enablement platform where people can share ideas and we can have people dynamically work in agile teams to deliver innovative solutions whether it is uh, you know, hackathons uh, and, and such aspects. So at the core of what we're doing at SMP Global is like uh, Reina has mentioned, our agile teams, this immersive cohort experience and essential tech followed by these hackathons really uh, driving a lot of uh, innovation for us. Sorry, I needed to unmute. Um, I know that more of you would love to chime in, but we are ra sadly running out of time. Um, and we do have to wrap this up, but I'm sh I would encourage you to keep the conversation going amongst yourselves afterwards. Um, and wanted to thank you all really for your time. Uh, we've covered so much ground um, and your insights have all been truly wonderful and insightful. And each of you added something very valuable to this conversation. Um, we'll send you the key takeaways article that we'll be writing up on the back of this conversation once it's complete. And of course, we'd like to give a very special thank you to our sponsor of the event, IBM. Thank you again all for your time and insights. Um, and hopefully this was insightful to you and also to our viewers later on. Have a wonderful day, everybody. <laughs>